Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles this morning to the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to continue our study in Matthew. Now, you know, uh, last week, last week was kind of a cool study that we had because we found uh, the disciples going up on the top of the mountain with Jesus, and they got to witness um, Jesus being transformed, transfigured uh, in their very presence. And they were there with Moses and Elijah. Uh, What a magnificent moment that had to be for these three men. Um, A moment that, of course, changed their lives, I'm sure. Um, But as we were studying this, we also got to see, as we studied, the difficulty that they may have had still. And this is the importance, you know, a lot of times when we pray, we ask the Holy Spirit to teach us. We ask the Holy Spirit to minister to our hearts. Because, you know, as believers in Christ... We have that awesome privilege to have the Spirit of God dwelling in us, the Holy Spirit dwelling in us, and He's around us, and He works through us, and He fills us, and He empowers us. And you know, you just have to be reminded that at this event, at this transfiguration event, these men did not have the Holy Spirit within them like we do. They didn't have the spiritual eye, if you will, of the Holy Spirit to speak to them concerning everything that they were seeing, not only on the mountain, but also when Jesus was healing and teaching. Everything they were processing was going through the natural mind, if you will. And it really wasn't until Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit came upon the church, that we've been given this awesome, beautiful privilege to be enlightened to the things of God. And that's how we're able. You know, Paul says in Corinthians that the things of God, the things of the Spirit, are foolishness to those who don't know God, to those who don't know to have the Holy Spirit dwelling in them. To them, it's just fables, stories. To us, it's our very life, amen? And so, again, what a beautiful mountaintop experience that they had together. But the time of mountaintop experience comes to an end very quickly in our text this morning. So if you're in chapter 17 of the Gospel of Matthew, let's go ahead and pick this up. Um, Immediately after the transfiguration, this great meeting that they had up on the top of the mountain there, and we pick up our story in verse 14. It says, when they came down to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic, and he suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire, and often into the water. And so I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. And then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. And then the disciples came to Jesus privately, and they said, Why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said to them, Because of your unbelief. For assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. But however, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. So very, very interesting story here to start our time off this morning. And we, as you know, as you look in different Gospels, sometimes you get a little bit of added information that you maybe didn't read in one of the other Gospels concerning the very same event. 
So if you would, with me, just flip over to the next gospel, the gospel of Mark, and go to chapter 9, because Mark gives us more insight as to what was going on here um, with this child or this young man who was suffering so horribly uh, with this demonic spirit. We're going to find this in chapter 9, starting in verse 14. If I can get my pages apart here. There we go. So let's see what, this, let's see what Mark has to say about this, because he's going to give us some interesting insight here. In verse 14, it says, When he came to the disciples, when he came down from the mountain, he saw a great multitude around them, and the scribes were disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed, and running to him, greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? And then one in the crowd said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth. He gnashes his teeth. He becomes rigid. And so I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. And he answered them and he said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. And then they brought him to him. And when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him. And he fell on the ground and he wallowed, foaming at the mouth. And so he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And the father said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. And immediately the father of the child cried out and he said with tears, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. And when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And then the spirit cried out and convulsed him greatly and came out of him, and he became as one dead. And so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And Jesus said, this kind comes out by nothing but prayer and fasting. So Mark gives us a lot more information here on this story about this young man and his father. And so, interesting, you, you take one minute and you think, okay, here we are, uh, Peter, James, and John returning from this awesome mountaintop experience. And I may have said this last week, some of us as Christians, we've had mountaintop experiences. Maybe in a corporate setting, at a conference, or at a prayer meeting, or, or whatever, or maybe just being out on your own, out praying to the Lord, and you just had this great experience in prayer time with God. And, and you feel like when you left that place, that experience, that, man, everything is going to be cool. Everything's going to be easy from here on out, right? But as soon as you get back to reality, so to speak, the enemy's right there waiting for you. He's right there waiting to rob us of that great experience that we have had with God. You know, being on a mountaintop is great. As a young Boy Scout, we, we used to, every year, we would go up into the high Sierras and we would spend three weeks up there hunting or hiking and camping and fishing. Uh, we climbed Mount Whitney. We, we did all these great things and there was you know, a whole week at one time where we would be above the timberline. We would be so high up on the mountain that no trees would grow, no plants would grow. It was just barren. 
But we were on the mountaintop, and the view was great, and everything was wonderful, and the fishing was great. But you know what? There was no fruit growing. There was nothing growing up there. It wasn't until we came down into the valley, it wasn't until we left the mountaintop and came down into the area where you begin to see fruit growing and plants and flowers blooming. And so it is in our Christian experience. Sometimes we think that by being on the mountaintop, we've arrived. But just remember, there's not a whole lot of growth going on. There's, the growth is happening in the valley. But you know what else is happening in the valley? Spiritual warfare, evil, wickedness. That's also going on in the valley. And how many times do we come down from such a great, maybe you've been at a men's conference and you come home and you're just excited and pumped up and then your car blows up or, you know, something terrible happens and you're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, Lord, I was so close to you and now as soon as I get home, this, what's going on? Well, this is the kind of thing that we see going on here with the Lord and his disciples. And I kind of feel for the nine that were left behind because there they were in the valley. There they were on the battlefield, if you will. And they have this, this, this situation with this young boy. Now, how many of you have had somebody come to them and say, oh, I, I, have, I have a son and he needs some help? And you say, oh, I want to help. And so you reach out and you want to help, but have you ever failed? Have you ever walked away thinking, oh my gosh, I failed, I didn't do something right, I don't know what it was? Well, I can imagine that these nine men were going through much of the same type of emotion. Why could not we cast it out, they asked. How come it didn't work for us? Is there a magic potion? Is there something that we didn't say? Did we not pray right? Should we have put our hands on them or blown on them or what did we do? You know, well, I think that's pretty typical, and then you feel bad for these men because <laughs> they've failed the mission. I mean, think about it. It wasn't too much earlier where Jesus commissioned them, and he said, all power and authority have been given to you. You're going to go out, and I don't want you to take supplies. I don't want you to take money. I don't want you to take all a bunch of stuff with you. I want you to go out and preach the gospel. I want you to heal the sick. I want you to cast out demons, and I'm giving you the authority to do that. So now here Jesus is on the mountain. He's gone for a little while, and they're left to the commission to do the business of the Lord, and they fail. They're discouraged, I'm sure. Have you ever tried to do the business of the Lord and felt like you failed? I know what that feels like, too. It makes you kind of feel like just closing up the book and saying, maybe I should be flipping hamburgers for a living. Maybe I'm not meant to be doing this, right? We get discouraged. But you know, discouragement is part of growth sometimes. It depends on how we respond to what we would consider failure. Do we get up and brush ourselves off and go back at it again? Or do we retreat and say, I quit. I'm never going to do it again. It hurt my pride. You know, I'm, we made this big deal about having this great revival and only two people showed up. What's going on, you know? We can feel defeated. But I just want to tell you this morning, it's really important that when we kind of go through these kind of things in our lives, don't give up. Seek the Lord in prayer. Ask him for guidance. Perhaps, he says, that really wasn't the ministry that I had planned for you. You thought that's what I wanted you to do, but that really wasn't what I've called you to do. I want you to do this. And so you step over and you begin to do this, and all of a sudden God starts blessing it. Or you continue moving forward and pressing forward in the ministry that you know he's called you to, and soon it begins to prosper. Soon you begin to see fruit from that ministry. You know, we're engaged in a ministry here at the church, the youth group ministry. That is not an easy ministry. It can be very discouraging. You can have a heart for every child and have no child show up, and then you start thinking, oh, Lord, what is going on? We continue to pray. We continue to move forward because we are in a battle with the evil one. 
And he will creep in at any point that he can to discourage you, to discourage me, or any of God's people from accomplishing the plan that he has set forth for his servants, which you and I are his servants. So there's this argument going on we see in Mark. And we're not too sure what they're arguing about, but it would appear that maybe they're arguing about the idea that the disciples couldn't help this boy. If you really are Jesus' disciples, you should have been able to heal him. What's the matter with you guys, right? Discouragement. That's what the enemy's voice does all the time. It's always yippity yapping there, right, on your shoulder saying, who do you think you are? You can't really do this. You can't accomplish this. You're not good enough. You're not holy enough. Who knows what this conversation was? These were the scribes. These were the lawyers of the law. And they're disputing with these uh, truly almost, if you would, unlearned men. So Mark's telling us in uh, uh, verse 17, well, Jesus asked in verse 16, what are you guys arguing about? What's, what's the argument? And all of a sudden, the man in the crowd speaks up, and he says, they're arguing about my son. He, he's possessed by a spirit. Now, Matthew's gospel uses the word epileptic here. I would think that maybe from an outer look at what's going on with this young boy, that perhaps somebody might say, oh yeah, he has ep that's what he has, he has epilepsy. But you know, Jesus never said that. Jesus never said, oh, he's okay, we'll heal him, he just has a little problem with epilepsy is all. Not a hard thing to heal. But that's not how Jesus saw this. Jesus saw this as a spirit in this boy causing these things to happen to him. Now, I don't know where you all stand on this because this is very mysterious. It almost borders the bizarre. And, and oh, yeah, you know, you can tune in to hundreds of zombie shows and all kinds of demon shows out there, you know, and it plants these images in people's minds about heads spinning all the way around and, you know, green stuff and, you know, all the things that we've seen in, in Hollywood. But this, this exceeds even Hollywood. This is very, very uh, descriptive, almost hard to read. What this spirit was doing to this young boy throws him into the fire to try to burn him alive. He throws him into the water to kill him. And, and dad, he's at his wit's end. He doesn't know what to do. He's taken them to the disciples. The disciples can't help. And now he's truly, truly without hope. You ever come to the Lord and you feel hopeless? You know, that can reflect in our prayer so many times. And, and, and some of the words that the man said here to Jesus, he said, if you can, can you just do something to help us? See, the poor man, he was asking Christ for help. He was asking Jesus for a miraculous miracle. But yet he didn't know what to expect. He had actually put limits on Jesus' ability to help him. If you can do anything at all, just maybe to soothe him or anything that you can do to help us. And Jesus replied by saying, Everything, anything, all things are possible to those who believe. And his father said immediately, I do believe. But there's a part of me that doesn't. There's a part of me that doesn't understand what's going on here. There's a part of me that's viewing my circumstances as being much larger than your ability as a healer as one who might be able to fix my son. You know, this is a matter of perception, perspective, if you will. 
You know, I can go outside on a full moon, lit night, beautiful. And I can get right in a perfect position and I can actually, I can take my thumb and I can actually block out that moon with my thumb. Does that mean my thumb's bigger than the moon? Absolutely not. It's a matter of perspective, isn't it? It's perception. And I think sometimes we do that with our issues. We take our issues and we try to use our little thumbs and we block out the moon and we say, oh, the problem's just too great. There's no way God could overcome this, this big problem here. This man's perspective was very limited. He said, Lord, I do believe. But there's a part of me that doesn't. I do have faith, but there's a part of me that's really struggling with, with this whole thing that I'm seeing with my eyes, processing this information. And I love his prayer. Lord, I do believe, but please help me with my unbelief. Now, we've seen several occasions where demonic activity has been taking place during the ministry of Christ. And many would say that this was happening because there was a, a demonic escalation in activity during the first coming of Christ. And many say that one of the signs of his second coming will be the increase of demonic activity in the world. Take a look around. We see it live in living color all around us every day. It's, there's no doubt, there's no argument that evil is on the rise. There's no doubt that more and more people are giving up on God and Christ and turning to their own selves or turning to some other power to maybe try to find fulfillment in their lives, which they are never able to do. And so this poor boy here, who has been suffering with now, I don't know. Look, there was another man that was lame. Because you're going to be asking this question. You're going to say, why would God allow a little child to be demon-possessed? Why would God allow this boy to live all those years and with this struggle? Well, there's another story in the Bible about a man that was lame. He was lame from his birth. And when Jesus went to heal him, some of the disciples said, So, Lord, why is this guy lame? Was it because of a sin that his mother had or a sin that his father had? Because they believed that when a person was born with some sort of an infirmity, it was reflected because of sin from one of the parents. That was just kind of a superstition that they, that they carried. Same kind of a superstition that said, if all you do is give birth to girls, you're cursed. There's something wrong. If you don't have a boy, God's not blessing you. That truly was part of that culture. And so they really had a limited view, a limited understanding of these things. What did Jesus say about the lame man? He said, no, it's not because of his mother. It's not because of his father. It's because God wants to demonstrate his power through this event. And then he turns around and heals the lame man. For that reason alone, this man was allowed to be born like that. So that one day, Jesus would come to him and heal him and glorify himself in doing it. Is it possible that this was allowed for much of the same purpose? That Jesus Christ would be glorified in doing such a miraculous event as this? And I should point out also to you, yeah, he tried to throw him in the fire, this, this spirit, it, I'll call it. It's not called a he in here, it's called an it, so we'll stick with that. Tried to put him in the fire, tried to put him in the water, convulsed him, foaming at the mouth, freaking out. It says he became rigid, like totally stiff, all kinds of horrible things. 
But let me just say this. He survived every single one of those to get to this place right here on this day in this moment of time. And another thing that we might take a look at this morning is that Jesus did not go through a bunch of contortions. There wasn't a bunch of smoke coming up. There wasn't any dancing around the guy. There wasn't any weird things happening. He just told the spirit, split. Get out of there and don't ever come back again. And that's all it took. Can you imagine all the people standing there watching this happen go, wow, he made that look easy. Well, it was for him. For them, it was impossible. For him, it was easy. Is that true today in your issues? In some of those things that you might think might be close to impossible? Can God still fix it? Can God repair those? Can God restore these things? How about, you know, how about things, personal things like bitterness? How about spewing filth out of our mouths? How about unforgiveness, jealousy, backbiting? These are things that dwell within our hearts. Is God big enough and powerful enough? Because we're not. But is he big enough and powerful enough to to repair that heart, to heal that stuff, to help us to forgive? Absolutely. Look around. You'll see people all around you who have experienced that very thing. For them, it was impossible. But with God, there is no impossible. Amen? All things are possible with God. So this, this in the midst of this great human need... In the midst of this tragedy, Jesus comes, and he's calm. He's not going to get engaged in the argument. He's not going to get sidetracked by the, 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 the debate that's going on. His focus is on this boy and his father. And without doubt, he said, you know, if you just have the faith, you can move a mountain. Your faith was a mustard seed. You can move a mountain. And it's not the first time he said it. In another place, you could say, tell that mountain to be thrown into the sea and it will happen. How many mountains in our lives do we have? That's that's kind of an old cliche, isn't it? That person could move mountains. Well, not literally, but he did great things as though he were moving mountains. Some of us have mountains in our lives that need to be moved, that God is waiting to do that for us. He wants to do that for us. Have mercy, he said, on my son. Please, Jesus, please help my son. His seizures were terrible. And even even when the boy first saw Christ, what happened? He was thrown to the ground. He was foaming at the mouth. What a sight in front of all those people, flailing. And people just going, oh, that's gross. Oh, man, that guy's sick. There's nothing we can do. And the Lord's not feeling that way. God's feeling compassion on this young boy and on his father. And so this miracle of deliverance takes place. Jesus rebuked the demon. Question, are there really demons? Are there demons today? I would say absolutely. Absolutely. And you know, one of the commonalities we find in, especially in the Old Testament scriptures, and Paul speaks of it a little bit in the New, but he talks about how some drugs were used for witchcraft, uh, speaking to the dead, doing false signs and wonders, that that they would take these drugs that would open up their mind, if you will, or their spirits to demonic influence. Now you look around today. Oh, God help our youth. You know, when I grew up, I grew up in a culture where There were a lot of drugs going around. A lot of you know that, too. You were there. 
But some of the drugs that were going around when we were growing up are so much different than the ones that are going around today. The drugs that these kids are using today, and many adults too, literally are turning them into animals. It's literally taken away their humanity. You can see it by their behavior, and you wonder, what is going on? Could it be that there's some sort of a demonic influence in the use of these drugs that enhances the demonic ability to possess people? I think so. I believe so. Do you know that the word witchcraft in the Bible is the Greek word pharmakia? Pharmakia. Where do we get that? What's our English word? It's pharmaceutical. It's drugs. It's true. They were used. And, and so, are there demons? Absolutely. Is it on the rise today? Absolutely. Is there a direct attack on God's people through that influence? Absolutely. You know, I'm hearing adults who are in positions of power literally saying on the Senate floor, in the House, if these cotton-picking Christians would just get out of the way, they're the problem. It's them Jesus people that are the problem. This is blatant, right? No more subtlety about this. This is war. We're at war. We're at war against evil. But I'm going to tell you something right now. We're not fighting that battle in our own strength. We're going to use the power of the living God, right? And I'm not encouraging you to run around and grab some of these children and try casting demons out of them, okay? I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just saying we need a sense of awareness. And I know for sure that it's not so much about capturing them and holding them down and locking them up as it is exposing them to what real love is. They don't know. They have no clue. As a matter of fact, they are so, people are so confused today about love that they don't even know what gender they are anymore. Really. I mean, that's sad. Think about that. That is sad. We're living in a culture right now that whatever you imagine you are, then you are. Not only is it sad, but it's stupid. Is it not? It's foolishness. You know, the Bible says, it's the fool who has said in his heart, there's no God. And when you do that, what are you left with? Foolishness. Stupidity. Darkness. Jesus said, you could not cast this one out because of the lack of your faith. You know, I, I, how long do I have to put up with you guys? I've given you all the tools You know, you want to be a mechanic? You want to work for a living? Okay, good. So I'm going to go out and I'm going to buy you a whole rollaway full of snap-on tools, thousands of dollars, and I'm going to put them in your garage for you. And I'm going to put a sign up there that says, mechanic on duty. And we're even going to bring some cars for you to work on. But you won't even get off the couch and go out there and open a toolbox. If you can't get off the couch and go out there and open a toolbox, it doesn't matter what resources are there. If you don't want to use them, then they're worth nothing. And I think that a lot of Christian people are doing that today. I think a lot of people have all the resources they need, but they're not willing to get out there and use them for whatever reason. There's a million reasons why not. What if I look stupid? What if I don't succeed? What if their car blows up after I work on it? I mean, we can make all kinds of excuses, right? Because you have so little faith, Jesus said. Now, if you really had faith, you could move mountains. If you really had faith, nothing would be impossible. Awesome things happen when a person has faith and they pray. To have the faith to believe that Jesus can heal a person doesn't mean that Jesus is going to heal every person. 
That's the hard part, isn't it? Well, if God's a God of love and we pray for that person that's having, you know, terminal disease, then why doesn't he heal them all? I'll refer you to ask him that when you get there. But I do believe that every time we see God heal, especially in the Bible, especially during his ministry, it, the main reason was that he would declare, look, I'm God, and I'm proving it by healing this person here. Sometimes people receive their ultimate healing when they take their last breath and find themselves in the presence of the Lord. Many of you know that today. So either way, God's plan, either way, all things, we read it this morning, work together for the good, for those who love God, and for those who are called according to his purpose. Every born-again, spirit-filled Christian, God has given us his power, the power of the Holy Spirit, to be used in any manner of ways by God. And you look around there's a mountain, if you will, of need. A mountain of human need. We do what we can. We're going to go over here and have our little uh, thing on Sheridan Days. And, and, and we want everybody to come and to participate and be part of it. Little evangelists out there running around sharing with people. Inviting people to church. Sometimes that's all it takes. They just want to be invited. They want to feel welcome. So Jesus healed the boy. And then we get to verse 22. I want to finish this up here. It says, while they were staying in Galilee, Jesus said, the son of man's about to be betrayed into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And on the third day, he'll be raised up. And they were exceedingly sorrowful. Again, they're viewing things through the natural mind. They're unable to see God's plan. We saw that with Peter when he said, there's no way. I'm not going to let them hurt you. They don't understand. They will not understand until after the resurrection. And they came to Capernaum. Those who received the temple tax came to Peter and he said, does your teacher pay tax to the temple? And he said, yeah. And when he had come into the house, Jesus anticipated him saying something about the taxes. And Jesus said, well, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take customs or taxes? From their sons or from strangers? If your dad's a king, do you think you're going to have to pay taxes? No. It's the subjects that have to pay the taxes. Not the son. So what's Jesus saying here? What's the tax? It's not a federal tax. It's not a Roman tax. It's a temple tax. It was to help maintain. As a matter of fact, it was in the law. Any person over 20 years old, any male, was required to pay a temple tax. A small amount, which was about three days wages, that would go to the maintenance and upkeep of the temple. Not too much to ask, I wouldn't think. But here's the thing. Jesus poses the question, does the king's children pay taxes? No. Does the king's son pay taxes? No. Who are they paying the taxes to? The temple. Who owns the temple? God. And there he is, in the flesh, right in front of them. Jesus owns the temple. He's the one that they're worshiping and they don't even know it. And so truly he's exempt from having to pay these taxes. But here's something else I want you, this is amazing. Both of these incidents speak of his deity, his power, his omniscience. What do they do? They owe some taxes. Peter said, <laughs> Peter said well, they get those taxes from strangers and, and Jesus said, you're right, the sons are free from that. But nevertheless, Jesus said, lest we offend them, go to the sea, cast in a hook, and take the fish that comes up first. And when you've opened its mouth, you will find a piece of money. Take that and give it to them for me and for you. 
Say, what? Look, Jesus, I'm a professional fisherman. Remember? I'm Peter. We fish with nets. We bring in thousands of them. You want me to go out with a little fishing pole and stand on the end of the beach and try to catch one fish? How childish is that? I mean, Peter might have been thinking, this is crazy. I'm a... Guys, let's get the net and go out. No, Jesus said, no. You go. Take your little fishing pole, throw it in the water, and the first fish that you catch, open its mouth. Now, how in the world did that happen? How in the world did Jesus know to summon that fish to latch on to Peter's line having a coin in its mouth? Now, it's not out of the question to understand why he might have a coin in his mouth. They're silver. They're shiny. Fish are attracted to that kind of stuff. It's very possible that he could have found it on the bottom and scooped it up. But how is it that Peter would catch that one of a billion fish that had that coin in his mouth? Only God can do that, guys. Only God. It's a testament. It's it's evidence that he is the Christ, that he knows all things. He's all powerful. He knew about that fish long before this incident ever took place. And the coin that was in the fish's mouth was enough to pay the perfect amount for the taxes for Peter and Jesus. Perfect amount. Could you imagine when Peter pulled that fish up and opened his mouth and there's a drachma in there? Oh my gosh. This truly is the Son of God. It's just a small thing, isn't it? It's a very small miracle that you ever hardly hear about. But it's huge. It's huge to see how this could actually... Well, most people would say, that is impossible. That is impossible. But we know all things are possible with God. Amen? All things are possible and God will provide for our needs. He provides for our needs in a miraculous way. God is there. Always for you and me to help us out, no matter what our difficulties might be. Why don't we have uh, worship guy, folks come on back up here, guys and gals, I should say. So maybe this morning you, uh, I'm not going to say you're behind on your taxes, but maybe this morning you got some issues. Maybe this morning you need prayer. I just want to encourage you, take a moment. Come over and visit Lonnie and Chris and pray with them. They would love to pray with you. I know it takes a little bit of humility to to get up and do that, but I promise you it always is worth it, always. When we take a step of faith like that, when we put our pride to the side and we say, yes, I do have needs, I do need prayer today, if that's you, I want to encourage you before you leave to get that taken care of. Father, I want to thank you for your greatness, for your awesome, unlimited power, for your wisdom. Lord, we want more of that. We want to be more like you. Lord, we want to We want to be your ambassadors in this dark world in which we live. We want to bring light into the darkness. We want to be available. We want to surrender to you today for whatever you might have for us. We want to trust you with all of our heart, not leaning on our own understanding, but in all of our ways acknowledging you allowing you to direct our paths. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.